The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Joining us is uh, Gregory A. Fonnier, and we're going to talk about his book, Terror in Ypsilanti. It's the John Norman Collins Unmasked book. Thank you for being here, Greg. Thank you for having me. Wow. So this is quite a story. So, Greg, what got you into this story um, enough to write a book? Uh, it's a very personal story with me. I lived a block up the street from John Collins and had several uh, interactions with him that were uh, negative interactions, but I didn't know his name. I didn't uh, know him, uh, really. And then walking home from classes at Eastern Michigan University one afternoon, uh, his house uh, where he rented a room uh, was uh, cordoned off, surrounded by half a dozen uh, uh, police cars, and a crowd of about 50 people. And, you know, so obviously I knew something was uh, happening. And, uh, well, when I got there, I said, well, you know, uh, what's, what's happening? And somebody told me the, the guy who's killed all those girls was just arrested in that house. So that was my first uh, uh, link uh, between him, me, and who he was. Uh, and in the evening papers, it was announced, uh, uh, his name was announced, John Norman Collins, captured, uh, suspected killer of blah, blah. And uh, so, of course, that left a big impression on me. And then uh, a book came out called The Michigan Murders five years later, and it changed the names of the victims. It, it uh, masked the killer's name. And... Uh, novelized a story, a very free uh, novelization of uh, of a story. And so as years went on, people were more and more confused about, well, what really happened? And, and uh, there was it this place or that place? Uh, so when I retired uh, in 2009, 2009 um, I, I wrote a, a book uh, called Zug Island. And then for my second project, I thought, well, uh, there's a great story that happened just down the street from me that has never been told in a factual way. So I then and there decided to write a non-fiction treatment of his story, and it's done very well. I'm curious to know how your story expands on that novel, because I read that novel this week, and the whole time, I read it before years ago, but just to refresh myself, and I was curious reading it i noticed a lot of things seem to be changed of course the killer's name but uh, obviously as you were saying it's fictionalized so how does your book differ from it in that sense well i, I can say that first of all it uh uh is a story that i'm uniquely uh able to tell uh i under understood the ca campus culture 50 years mm -hmm. ago I lived a block up the street. We knew many uh, of the same people. I did not know uh, any of the victims personally, but uh, when I became a teacher in Ypsilanti, I would have had one of the the victims as a uh, an English student, and uh, I had some of her friends. And people in, in town really didn't talk about it at all for you know, almost 50 years, it was, uh, you know, kind of the town's hidden secret. And uh, so I started writing the book and contacting people and people who I had known through my Ypsilanti experience started coming forward. And it, it just, uh, the story started telling itself. And the, the broad strokes of, of the Michigan murders uh, book covers the Karen Sue Bynuman case uh, mainly. And I tried to give more details about the six other murders, and much of that information had never been published before, and not in the Michigan murders as well. So I tried to give a rounder portrait, and I also did not want to do anything that was lurid. Uh, yeah. 
or uh, uh, make things up about uh, the victims because there was not a lot of quality information. Uh, the, the parents of, of the victims didn't want to talk. And uh, Edward Keyes, and, and the Michigan Murders author, uh, really did not talk to anybody that uh, uh, was related to the victims. And essentially, they went by what was in the newspapers and what the police uh, and authorities uh, told him. Mm-hmm. So I, I have a rounder portrayal of it, 50 years of hindsight mm-hmm. and a an understanding of campus culture. And in addition to that, uh, three of his professors, he, he was an English uh, major, uh, and I uh, am and was an English major, uh, those three professors I also had, and they came forward with information. So, uh, yeah, and I, I could go on. Uh, uh, the second part of the book is about the court case, and mm-hmm. a lot of that uh, was in Keyes' book, too, although there were liberties taken with uh, that story. Uh, I got all of my information from newspaper accounts and uh, uh, legal government documents. Uh, I had the Freedom uh, of Information Act uh, request on uh, thousands of pages of prison and uh, state police documents. Uh, But it's really the third part of my book that is uh, totally new, and that's about John Collins' years in prison. And there's not much about him through the first two-thirds of the book because he didn't talk at all uh, on, on lawyer's orders uh, during his court case, and of course we didn't know who he was uh, while he was killing all of these uh, girls. But uh, uh, the prison part of the book, uh, he starts uh, reaching out to the press and uh, trying to create a an alibi uh, and a justification and uh, to make uh, uh, people feel that he is the victim, not the girls he killed, and uh, all of those things uh, uh, were not in that original book. So, uh, uh, you know, and I'm very proud of that part. Well, I appreciate you expanding on that. And I was curious, too, I know that in the original trial, most of the evidence was considered circumstantial evidence, which is apparently how he manages to claim that, you know, he's the victim in all this. But uh, Sheriff Douglas Harvey in a recent interview said that there were uh, some DNA testing going on and that DNA belonging to Collins had been found on clothing belonging to one of the victims or something like that. Could you explain what's well, actually yeah, going on? He, he uh, would know more about that than I would. Uh, John uh, never willingly gave up his DNA because he said, oh, the government, uh, the police, uh, they'll try to entrap me somehow and mm-hmm. and find me guilty when I'm not in one thing or another. Now, in 2002, though, uh, in Michigan, all of the, uh, uh, you know, prison inmates had to give up a cheek swab and get the, the DNA. And he... Uh, Sheriff Harvey uh, seems to think uh, that the, one of the later murders, Alice Callum, or Colomb, I'm not sure, I think it's Callum, um, he had picked her up uh, at a dance and whatnot, and uh, uh, she was on his motorcycle. And according to Doug, uh, he must have reached back and grabbed her on the thigh while they were driving. And some of his sweat and epithelials uh, were found on her pantyhose. I, I can't co- collaborate, uh, corroborate that mm-hmm. uh, myself, but uh, you know he's more in a position to know than I am. Now I'll and, defer to his judgment on that. Yeah, and and on that note, I, I had a question. Al and I were discussing this before you came on. The story that he told about the psychic Peter Herkos, 
Do you yeah. have any? Can you expand on that and tell us how much of that is actually true? Most of the Herco stuff is true, and uh, uh, the reason I can say that confidently is that Peter was a uh, publicity hound. He wa- was a celebrity psychic, mm-hmm. and uh, so everywhere he went, everything he did while he was in Ypsilanti and Ann Arbor. Uh, he had the press following him around. And so, uh, you know, all of the, the information that we have about Peter is, um, is is accurate. And the one very amazing thing uh, that Peter said, uh, he went into the basement where Karen Sue Bynaman was murdered, and he used to do the, I forget what he called it, but, Vibrations, you know, that the things, uh, inanimate objects would give off a certain aura uh, or a vibration. So he would go down in the basement and he'd feel on the floor and look all, you know, what over. Anyway, he uh, had a prediction that uh, when the guy, uh, the murderer was killed, that he would uh, be a foreigner, he would have Canadian money in his pocket. And that there was a makeshift ladder laying on the floor somewhere in, in, in his vision. And as it turned out, when Sheriff Harvey and, and the rest of the, the police, the investigators went down in that basement, uh, they found a ladder laying along the wall. And when Collins was arrested, they discovered he was born in Canada, and he did have some Canadian money in his pocket, probably because he was thinking of, you know, escaping uh, across the Ambassador Bridge uh, into Windsor. That's the only reason I would think that he would have Canadian money in his pocket. But uh, uh, Sheriff Harvey said, you know, he, he, I'm very skeptical, but when he said those three things, the hair stood up on the back of my neck. And uh, uh, But Peter Herkos, uh, in further discovery, we found out that he had secretly come into town. He had a, 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 a private investigator do a lot of his uh, snooping around for him, and he uh, was able to glean that information. So uh, there's, there's no psychic power there. Uh-huh. And as a footnote to all of this, uh, and I've never told anybody this before, uh, Peter Herkos's widow lives rather close to me, probably within 30 miles. And uh, she got in touch with me, and I thought, oh, she's going to be upset, uh, give me a hard time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, you know, I, I tried to tell tell it like it was, and uh, about. Uh, Peter being a fraud and so on. And she wanted me to ghostwrite her story about her life with Peter. And she was his shill in his uh, Hollywood act and his uh, uh, Las Vegas act. Very pretty, blonde girl, uh, very buxom distraction, which is what a shill does. And, uh, And she asked me if I would write his story and fulfill the final chapter of his prophecy. Hmm. And I said, no, I backed off of that one. I don't, <laughs> I don't, uh, I don't do, uh, uh, you know, uh, ghost writing and, and so on. So, uh, hmm. And she says, well, I really like your style. And I said, I'm surprised because, you know, I was critical of your husband. And she says, well, it's not being critical when you tell the truth. So huh. I, yeah, I took that as a great uh, compliment. Wasn't he also uh, involved in the Lindbergh kidnapping case? No, uh, he was involved oh, in Boston Strangler. The, uh, the Boston Strangler That's right. case. That's right. He self-involved, uh, uh, was self-involved. Uh, nobody asked him to come to Boston, but his career was on the skids. Uh, in the 60s, celebrity uh, psychics were all the rage on 
uh, Johnny Carson and uh, the Mike Douglas show, mm -hmm. uh, you know, those types of uh, shows, Merv Griffin. And, uh, but after a while, it, it was getting old and he wasn't getting the bookings anymore. And uh, so he uh, went to Boston, interjected himself in the case, and got himself arrested by the Boston police. And they were going to press charges if he didn't get out of town immediately. Mm -hmm. They did not want an amateur in there messing up their investigation. And what really uh, sealed it for the police was when Herkos impersonated a Boston police detective and started harassing one of the witnesses uh, of the, the the Boston Strangler uh, case. I don't know what the man witnessed. He didn't witness any uh, of the killings, but uh, he was somehow connected to it. And Peter Herkos just leaned on him real, real hard. But what Herkos uh, didn't know was this man was emotionally disturbed, suffered from uh, severe depression, and he had to be hospitalized after Peter Herkos tried to scare him into giving him information. Mm -hmm. So Herkos was arrested, and, uh, and and I already told the other part of the story, you get out of town or we're pressing charges. And he couldn't get out of town fast enough. Wow. Well, I really appreciate you expanding on that, because now it all makes sense. <laughs> um, but I also wanted to ask you, there's... Uh, theories that Collins was involved in murders in California as well. Could you talk about that and what evidence there is to indicate he may be responsible for those crimes? Well, one in particular, uh, he was suspected of possibly three. Uh, he was left Ypsilanti. The police are starting to close in a little too much on him. And in addition to being a, uh, a killer, uh, and a, uh, a butcher, really. Uh, he was a compulsive thief. And him and his buddy, uh, roommate, uh, had been out uh, stealing credit cards and wallets and breaking into houses and cars and so on. Well, the police were starting to close in on him. So uh, he and his friend fraudulently rented a trailer with a check that they had stolen from one of, of the apartments that they broke into. That's right. Paid rental. Uh, so it was a fraudulent check. And they took the trailer out to Salinas. Andy Manuel, Collins' his friend, uh, his, his grandparents lived uh, in Salinas. So they went out and parked the trailer in the alley for free. Uh, in back of his grandfather's house, and they were only there for, well, it was under a week, four or five days at the very most. And uh, a young 17-year-old woman uh, called Roxy Phillips uh, was found dead, uh, cut up, and thrown in uh, Pescadero Canyon. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, 10 miles away, 15 miles away from Salinas. And uh, there was evidence, uh, physical evidence, linking Collins to the crime. And, and real quickly, one of the uh, California detectives working the case and who found the body uh, developed a real bad a, a case of poison oak. And he thought, well, I wonder if the killer happened to have poison oak, too. Mm -hmm. So uh, the detective went around within a you know, five-mile radius, whatever, uh, and asked different doctors uh, if anybody treated somebody uh, for poison oak recently uh, from Michigan. And lo and behold, one of the doctors said yes, and they had his name. Uh, you know, John Collins, uh, or uh, he may have given a, a false name. That part I'm not sure of. But uh, uh, Collins panicked. He took the car to uh, 
a, a Pontiac dealer had the trailer hitch taken off. They deserted the trailer, and him and uh, Andy Manuel went back to Michigan in a trip that was supposed to take three weeks to a month was about a 10-day trip, and uh, the landlady had not rented uh, uh, the rooms out or anything, so they just moved right back into their old rooms and hid out there. When the body was found, there, she, uh, Roxy, had on a red print dress, a little uh, floral print, and, uh, and with a matching belt. They found her nude body with this belt around her neck, and she had been strangled to death. Back in Michigan now, Collins is under suspicion for the murder of Karen Sue Bynum, and his car is impounded. They take it apart, and they take the seats out, and they find on the, the, the seat rail a piece of fabric red fabric with the same floral print, the same warp and weave in the fabric, 100% identical. And that linked Collins with direct physical evidence mm -hmm. for the California murder. He, uh, that was a slam dunk case out in California. And there were two witnesses that saw her in his car. Well, he had a problem with that. Now, that's how he came uh, to the attention of authorities, right, was witnesses who saw him with the victims. Wasn't he seen with at least three or four of the victims You know, in, Mi uh, in Michigan? One that uh, I'm sure of, uh, well, actually, the first one, the Fleasure uh, murder, uh, yes, he had been seen at Silver Lake with her, uh, and uh, Alice Callum, he had been seen with her, but uh, I, w I was able to uh, pinpoint uh, that he had been seen or uh, was known to have been with each of the seven victims. And police will tell you, <clears throat> you know, uh, they don't believe when it comes to crime that there's anything uh, uh, real about coincidence. Yeah. Usually it's cover-up. But here we have the coincidence of him being able to, of Collins, being able to place him with all seven of the victims. Now, I would say that goes way, way beyond co uh, coincidence. Again, it's circumstantial, but you can be convicted on circumstantial evidence. Oh, it's yeah. And if there's the weight of it, and it's compelling enough. Well, and that brings up another point, too. How does he justify claiming that he's the victim in this case, or that he's somehow innocent when they're... I mean, what are the odds that somebody would be connected to seven of the victims but didn't kill them? That's what narcissists do. That's all I can answer uh, that one. And... and uh, uh, he can't take any personal responsibility for anything. Everyone is a liar but him. Mm -hmm. And uh, he really, over the years, hasn't been very effective at convincing people of that. He's <laughs> his own enemy. Yeah. Yeah, well, he also, uh, didn't he do some local... Uh, interview for a local t television station shortly after he was convicted in the 80s uh, or it something? was about uh, oh geez I'd say 10 years later mm -hmm. it might even be uh, about 10 years later yeah mm -hmm. and uh, he wanted to set up a, almost like a kangaroo court where he could act as his own lawyer because he wasn't allowed to speak during the trial yeah. So here he wanted to speak as his own lawyer uh, and uh, question the prosecutor, question uh, Sheriff Harvey, uh, other people connected uh, with his conviction. 
and then a lot of uh, a number of his uh, supporters were out in the live audience. Mm-hmm. Now Collins is doing this on a remote from Marquette Prison in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan uh, with a Detroit station. So they sent one of their uh, uh, reporters, Marilyn Turner, and uh, she interviewed him. And he hadn't really been around, uh, you know, an attractive woman for a long time in one thing or or another, you know, fill in the blanks. Mm -hmm. So uh, she goes up to interview him in prison, and you can tell that he's just very taken with her. And she, in a very masterful way, made him relax and, you know, tell his story and you know again it's all lies yeah uh, and then she asked him john do you love your mother and he lost it he just he couldn't talk it's, it's really about the only time he hasn't been able to talk she hit him right where he lives and he got a little bit weepy and uh yeah was, i i love my mom but he had if he did it was a love-hate relationship with her. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that because the story that I've heard is that his mother was a prostitute. And that well, that's had, Sheriff Harvey again. Yeah, that's uh, what I was going to say. It's a story I heard that he had that John had caught his mother with a trick and that, that that's been cited as some kind of uh, traumatic experience that could have caused this or whatever. So you're... you're throwing water on that saying that it may not well, be true. Well, yeah. You know, yes and no. I th- think the word prostitute uh is uh is where it all falls apart for me. Uh because I asked Doug and we've become friends uh, since it took 5 years to write this book he and I got together quite a few times. And uh he made that uh pronouncement at a Kiwanis meeting in Ann Arbor. And I asked him, I said, well, did you have any cooperation? Was there any physical evidence, you know, any evidence, eyewitness, whatever? And he said no. Hmm. But <coughs> here's, the, here's the deal with his mother. Uh, she may not have been the best mom. She was a single mom living in a very small, basically Catholic community. She sent her kids to Catholic school, but she never went to church, never went to any school events, never went to any of his sporting events, and he lettered in three sports in high school. She was a waitress, and she had to pay a mortgage and take care of three kids, and she worked very hard. But she was a single mom, and in that era, you know, people would gossip. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I think a lot of uh, uh, that talk was gossip. She's a single woman. She's able to date who she wants to. Uh, there had been a few men in her life uh, b- besides her two husbands. Uh, but a prostitute, uh, no. Uh, a, a lonely uh, single mom. I would say yes to that. And I did talk to one of John's high school friends who came home with him one day early from school. The boiler in the school broke down. It was winter. And they sent all the kids home. So John says, come on home and we can lift some weights in my basement. So they go to the house. And as they're going in the back door and down the stairs, this person said that he looked off to the left through the kitchen uh, into the living room and John's mother was there on the couch uh, making out with some guy Mm -hmm. there was was nothing I mean it wasn't they were naked it was nothing like that but just you know just normal stuff I'm uh, with with someone and uh you can imagine that you know, that kid probably told somebody who told somebody else, and then it got in the church uh, uh, rumor mill, and 
and then it just grew from there. But uh, no, I, I would not call her a prostitute, nor would I, I say that about his uh, older sister either. Mm-hmm. His, his older sister, her problem was, not a problem, uh, she liked older men. So when she was, you know, a, a late teen, 17, 18, 19 years old, she was going out with guy, guys in their mid-20s. Mm-hmm. So uh, mom and, uh, and daughter were considered uh, flamboyant, notorious people. And they both dressed to the nines. They always had their hair done. Looked like they spent a lot of time at the hairdresser. Uh, they wore costume jewelry, uh, and you know, just just did not fit the mold of uh, of, of what people thought uh, a mother should be. Well, doesn't that oh. fall into the ultimate problem that people have trying to explain why these people do these kinds of things? They want some sort of easy answer like that well his mother was a prostitute and he was traumatized and things because yeah i've read a he lot of strange things about a bunch him. of women yeah that, that's that's basically what most people will will uh, surmise uh he hated his mother but and i'm not going to deny that he had very mixed and hard feelings about her from other people i know who know collins and had seen him interact with his mother. Uh, and, you know, he was frustrated with her. I think uh, uh, he felt that she was a little too flirtatious, and uh, he didn't particularly like the way she dressed. Believe it or not, uh, Con- uh, Collins was a conservative Catholic. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I think he had probably been embarrassed by his mother. But I think what really made him flip uh, in my uh, uh, humble uh, opinion, because I'm not a psychologist, he had a girlfriend in high school, and it was uh, fairly steady, but, you know, off again, on again, and through the high school years. He went to central Michigan, and I, I don't know, she probably went to Wayne State or somebody, but uh, she went to a different school. They drifted apart, and Collins really missed her a, a lot, and uh, he came uh, uh, home on a weekend uh, or the Christmas holiday or something like that and asked her to go out and to see a movie. Uh, and then when they got together, he didn't take her to a movie. He went to Gross Point, parked in a real dark place up uh, on the uh, uh, shore of uh, uh, the Detroit River or maybe it was the uh, Lake St. Clair River. Uh, I don't remember which, but... Uh, and, and he wanted her to go out to the a pier. He sit on the pier and talk. And he, she said, I thought we were going to a movie. No, I, I don't want to go out there. What's on your mind? So they had to talk. And he said, I just want to know if, if we could, you know, if you still have feelings for me and if maybe we could uh, try, you know, try to get together again. And she told him no. I think that was a rejection that may have snapped Something may have snapped for Collins. Uh, I, uh, I believe he grew up feeling like he was the unwanted third child uh, because the mother, uh, you know, her second child uh, was a girl and a female. Uh, and uh, basically that was her alter ego. And growing up, they spent a lot of time together and got a lot of the attention and John uh, felt neglected. And then when his High school girlfriend neglected him. I believe that he got uh, uh, just something snapped inside of him. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, flashing uh, back uh, into uh, Ypsilanti and the first victim, uh, when Mary Fleischer rejected him, that might have been more than he could stand. And there was... uh, such rage that he wreaked upon her body that uh, it's even difficult to describe uh, what he did to her. Sounds like your book is uh, definitely something we should read because already in this conversation you've cleared up quite a bit of confusion for me. Yeah, Yeah, and uh, I have a, uh, 
I sold an option to a, a Toronto media company. Uh, they're trying to come up with uh, a short uh, trailer and uh, hopefully uh, sell it as a movie project, and uh, uh, I hope they do. Uh, mm, that's exciting. Um, now, do you have a website? Yes, I do. Uh, GregoryAFournier.com, and that's my author site. And I have a blog that's got about 425 uh, posts on it about different things I write and, and history. I, I'm a regional author. I live in California, but I'm a Michigan boy, and uh, I write about uh, Detroit topics. And my uh, blog is uh, Fornology. Uh, I dropped the U out of my name. Fornology, F-O-R-N-O-L-O-G-Y.com. And that is, uh, you know, my main marketing tool as well. Great. And I have a book coming out here. Uh, uh, I'm two weeks from uh, sending it to the publisher on Detroit's Purple Gang during the 20s and 30s. A uh, gang reputed to have killed over 500 people in their 10-year reign of terror. So wow. uh, my, my topics are a bit dark, but uh, uh, they do very well. Great. Well, we'll have your book up on our website as well as your website link, so people can uh, do one click. And uh, we recommend the book, Terror in Ypsilanti, John Norman Collins Unmasked, and our guest has been the author, Gregory A. Fonnier. Thanks for being here, Greg. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, Hosts or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you! If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. 